Tonight we have a two for the price of one deal for you. Uh, we have two scientists who you may have seen a lot of earlier in the year. They were um, all over the media um, for the story that you're about to hear. And tonight we are going to hear about the inside story behind the news um, from January. We're going to find out exactly how much hard work, grit and the luck um, goes into a story like this. And we're going to hear about their future plans, not only in motor neuron disease, but also in other neurodegenerative diseases. So our first speaker tonight will be Associate Professor Peter Crouch. Peter heads a lab in the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics, just over the road um, behind um, this building. Peter actually trained as a plant scientist, and he uh, did his PhD studying soybeans at La Trobe University. But he quickly saw the light and switched from um, studying bean curd to the brain uh, in the early 2000s with a series of projects looking at the role of copper in Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. Peter's current research theme is to identify new therapeutic compounds, but perhaps more importantly, work out how they work and why they work. You'd be surprised actually how many drugs that we currently are giving humans, we don't know why they work. And our second speaker will be Professor Kevin Barnum from the Flory. Kevin began his scientific career in Queensland with a PhD in chemistry in 1993, before heading overseas, as so many young Australians do, to London, where he studied at the University of London for a few years, and then returned to Australia, but saw the light and came down to Melbourne from um, Queensland. Uh, we also hear him call us Mexicans every so often. Um, he has a passion for discovering new therapeutic strategies for neurodegenerative diseases. So please join me in welcoming tonight's speakers. As uh, Tom said, uh, I work at the University of Melbourne and I have had an excellent opportunity over the last 10, 10 12 years to do some work which has led to what we hope will become one of the first and best effective treatments for motor neuron disease. I didn't set out to get into this work, but when the opportunity come, comes up to do something uh, meaningful, uh, it really is a special opportunity. So I'm very grateful to all of the people who have contributed to this work over many years, and I'm particularly grateful to those people who gave me this opportunity to really get stuck into this project. Those people specifically are Tony White, Paul Donnelly, and our second speaker for this evening, Kevin Barnum. Now, the reason why we're here tonight is to talk about a disease which many of you in this room will know about. For those of you who don't know about it, uh, unfortunately, it's not the sort of thing where when you learn about motor neuron disease, uh, it, it, le it leaves a, a heavy weight on your heart. It, it, there's unfortunately no good stories at the moment for motor neuron disease. If you are unfortunate enough to be diagnosed with motor neuron disease, you, you, have, a, you have a tough time ahead of you. Obviously, we're trying to change that, uh, but we're not there quite yet. So what does motor neuron disease do? Uh, it affects the cells in your central nervous system, which specifically convey signals from your brain to muscles throughout your body. So it doesn't take long to think about what it is that these neurons do to start appreciating what this disease will do to your life. Uh, your ability to breathe, your ability to swallow, your ability to speak, your ability to move, all slowly disappear. Now, prior to any initial symptoms of motor neuron disease, you will have led a, a healthy, uh, carefree life, yeah, by and large. Uh, it's the sort of disease which has no forewarning for most people. Uh, for, for, for the vast majority of people who get motor neuron disease, it just comes out of the blue. Uh, for many people, they've never even heard of the disease before. Uh, and, and usually the, on, the, the peak age of onset is roughly at about the age of 60 years, but it definitely can affect people who are much younger than that, uh, and it also affects people much older than that. But what happens is if you are diagnosed the next few years of your life, you're ba basically going to lose all of these abilities that you take for granted. Breathing, moving, speaking, swallowing. Uh, it's not an uncommon disease, by the way. Uh, about 2,000 people in Australia at the moment are, are living with this disease. Um, and it'll take the lives of about 700 
uh, Australians each year. Quite alarmingly, the number of people that this disease is affecting seems to be increasing. Now this is not just because our population is getting bigger, this is a percentage of the population where the incidence is going up. Now, whenever you get a disease, everyone's quite silent because I told you that this is going to leave a heavy, heart, a heavy weight on your heart. Um, everyone is very silent. Don't worry, we're going to try to impart upon you some of the good news that's coming out of the research that we do. The, um, uh, anyone who has a problem, a medical problem, goes to a doctor uh, and all you want to hear is two things. One is, what's wrong with me, doc? And number two, what drug do I take to get better? Uh, for motor neuron disease, unfortunately, the drugs that are available to you really aren't going to do that much for you. One of the drugs that will be prescribed to you, actually this is the drug that will be prescribed to the majority of people diagnosed with motor neuron disease, it's called Relizol. This drug has been in existence for quite some time. The reality is this drug is not going to do much for you. The graphs that I'm showing you here um, are basically graphs that show the amount of time from starting to take Relizol to the time that you ultimately need to have a tube put into your neck. So what, the, what each graph is showing is the difference between people who were given Relizol in a clinical study and people who were given a, a placebo drug. Without knowing much of the detail, what you can see is that in each of these graphs there's not much of a difference between the two curves. So basically what it's showing is that in terms of the time it takes until you need to get a, a tube put in your neck, there's not much of an effect by taking the drug. Uh, the good news is that the drug is slightly beneficial, but the reality is it's not very beneficial. Now each of these three graphs that uh, I'm showing each one represents a different dose of the drug that people have been taking. The lowest dose is at the top, the highest dose is at the bottom. One thing that you can already see is that there does not appear to be a dose-dependent relationship between the efficacy of this drug and the amount that you are taking. In this particular clinical trial, uh, the investigators also examined the adverse responses to this drug. So while the uh, while the therapeutic efficacy of the drug didn't show a clear dose response, the adverse responses to the drug did. Now the adverse responses aren't serious, but they are things that will make you feel a bit lousy. Things like nausea and dizziness. So even though this is pretty much the drug that will be prescribed to you if you have motor neuron disease, it's actually not uncommon for people to stop taking this drug. So this is what we've been working on. Uh, this is me at my desk a couple of days ago. You can't read the label on this drug, but this is a drug called Copper ATSM. So when I said that I'm fortunate to have this opportunity to work on something that we're hoping will improve the lives of people with motor neuron disease, this is the drug that I'm talking about. Uh, I didn't invent this drug. Actually, none of the people involved in this project invented this drug. This drug has been in existence for many, many years. Uh, I don't know much about chemistry. Our next speaker knows a lot about chemistry. I don't know much. I'm told by people who do know a little bit about chemistry that if you have a chemistry degree, you could probably go and make this drug. It's not a complex drug to make. The capacity to make it is known. What happened though here in Australia, in Melbourne specifically, was that the idea came up, now I'm not going to steal our next speaker's thunder, the idea came up to start testing this drug in animal models of motor neuron disease. Kevin will tell you exactly why we decided to start testing this drug in animal models of motor neuron disease. All I'm going to show you today is the outcomes of those studies in animal models of the disease. This is what I do. This is, this is my role in this whole project. Is, uh, uh, my team and I, we work in uh, the, the medical building. So for those of you familiar with the University of Melbourne might know the medical building. At the top of the medical building we have an animal facility. In that animal facility we have a lot of mice. Uh, some of those mice are what we refer to as a model of motor neuron disease. Basically it means that these animals, because of the way that they've been bred, because of the genetic information that they contain in their bodies, they will get what looks exactly like motor neuron disease. These animals will look healthy for the initial phases of their life, but after a certain period they will start losing functionality 
of muscles in their body because they're losing motor neurons in their central nervous system. Now, for those of you who've never tried this before, if you put a mouse on a rotating rod, I suspect nobody else in this room has tried this before, but if you put a mouse on a rotating rod that's slightly above the ground, the mouse will walk on top of it. Uh, this is known as the rotor rod test. We use this test in the laboratory to test the motor functionality of the animals. The idea is that if you have a healthy control mouse like this one here, it will stay on top of that rod and it will quite happily walk along and you can record how long it will stay on top of this rod. That will give you a readout of its functionality of its limbs. This is what a healthy mouse will look like. What I'm showing you on this graph here is that motor functionality in this assay relative to the age of the animals. So you can see that we've gone from about 100 days through to about, what, 270 days. That, by the way, is a relatively young mouse. This is probably the equivalent of going up to about the age of uh, maybe 30 or 40 years of age uh, in a human. You take a mouse that will develop motor neuron disease and this is what happens. It's performing relatively well initially, but then as it starts losing motor neurons in the central nervous system, its motor functionality starts to decline. This is exactly what happens to people with motor neuron disease. So we can record this in the laboratory in these particular mice. If we put a little bit of copper ATSM into the mice, they perform better. Their symptoms are delayed, they perform better. We put a little bit more of the drug into these mice, they perform better again, and a bit more of the drug, they perform better again. This is important. This is known as a dose response curve. The animals get more benefit from the drug as we give them more drug. We have not yet given a dose where the animals uh, are, are performing even better than this. We've not yet hit the ceiling, in other words, for how good this drug might be in these animals. Now, as per people with motor neuron disease, these animals will also die prematurely. If you give them uh, no drug, they die at a relatively young age. Like I said, for these mice, it's the equivalent of a human being at about 40 years of age. Uh, 200 days for a mouse to die is young. You give them a little bit of the drug, they survive more. More drug, they survive even further. So this is exactly what we want to see in a drug for motor neuron disease. A therapeutic effect in terms of motor function, but also an extension in survival. In this particular study here, what we've done is we've taken our drug, copper ATSM, and we've benchmarked it directly against the one drug that you will be prescribed if you are diagnosed with motor neuron disease. That is really as old. And you can see straight away that in terms of motor function uh, and in terms of survival in these animals, as per people with the disease, really as old doesn't really do that much for you. There's a little bit of something happening, but not that much. Copper ATSM, by contrast, is quite protective in these animals. An important facet of this study here, which had important implications for the, where our work is at the moment, is that we gave these animals really as old and copper ATSM together. Now, uh, it might not be apparent, but there is great clinical significance in doing that. If we were going to test this drug in people with motor neuron disease, can we still give it to them while they're taking the one drug that they've currently been prescribed? This study says, yes, you can. <coughs> now, this is an additional version of some of the graphs I've already shown you. This is just showing you how much of an extension in survival you get by treating these animals with copper ATSM. This is just a variation on the theme, but it's an important variation on the theme because what we've done in this study is we adopted what was set by the international motor neuron disease community as the bar for testing drugs in motor neuron disease model mice. There are many different models. There are many different ways to put drugs into animals. You can give it to, it, uh, to the animals early. You can give them to them late. This international body was getting fed up with all of these different drugs being described as being protective in the animals. What they wanted everyone to do was to just play on the same field, to do the same thing. So they set these criteria, we adopted these criteria, and this is the result that we got. Again, a protective effect. Now, using these particular criteria, again, I'm showing you another dose response curve. You give a little bit of drug, they improve a bit more, they improve more, and so forth. But this time, 
we're using these internationally set criteria for doing this type of study. Very rigorous criteria, but we're getting positive resp responses. But there's more to it. These data, this particular spot on this curve was generated uh, in my lab. This particular spot on the graph was generated in the United States by a separate research team. And this spot was generated by a third group. What we're talking about here is independent validation. This doesn't happen. So much so, this particular spot here, the one labelled ALSTDI, that stands for ALS Therapy Development Institute. This body set themselves up as a watchdog. They also were getting sick and tired of all of these drugs being described as having potential therapeutic effect. What they wanted to do was test the veracity of those studies. So for every drug that people were describing as having potential, they then took it into their own lab and they tried to replicate the result. For every drug that they've tested, they have not been able to reproduce those responses, the positive responses. That includes Rilizol. The one drug prescribed to people cannot be reproduced, in the animal models at least, by this international watchdog, the ALS-TDI, until they tested our drug. So we're not here to treat mice. We're here to treat people who have motor neuron disease. So the question is, will copper ATSM be protective? Will it be effective for people with motor neuron disease? I'm going to show you two pieces of evidence that are giving us great hope that it will. These images here are images of the brains of people with motor neuron disease. The red spots that you can see are copper ATSM in the brains of these people. These red spots that you can see are in a region called the motor cortex. This is where the motor neurons sit in the brain. So if you're going to have a drug that's going to be effective for people with motor neuron disease, you want it to go to this part of the brain, and it does. This study here was done by a group in Japan. It was not done by us. You can imagine that when this data set was published, we were very encouraged that copper ATSM in humans is going where it needs to go. And these data here, this is uh, the second last slide I'll show you before I hand over to Kevin. These data here were generated in Australia. These are the data that have been released from the first clinical trial of <coughs> copper ATSM as a therapeutic agent for motor neuron disease. What we're showing here is, again, another dose response. A little bit more, a little bit more, and a little bit more. Do we see a dose response to the drug? The difference here is that we're now looking for a therapeutic response in people with motor neuron disease. All you need to know is that as those bars go further up, that's indicating an improvement in the symptoms that these people had. Now there's a massive caveat here. This is what's known as a phase one trial. A phase one trial is not designed to get this type of result. Of course you look for this type of result, but it's not designed for it. The reason why it's not designed for it is a phase one clinical trial means it's the first time a drug has been tested as a therapeutic agent in people. The thing that you do in the phase one trial is you don't look for this, you look to just make sure that the drug is safe. That's what this phase one trial was designed to do. We can say, yes, we have identified a dose which is safe. But in this small number of patients, when we did have a quick look at their functionality, there's an indication that it's in, they're, they're showing an improvement. This is very exciting stuff. What this represents is the first time a drug has ever been developed and tested in Australia has actually gone into clinical testing for motor neuron disease. At this stage, the data are looking promising, but at this stage, there's a truckload work that still needs to be done before we can turn what looks like a promising result into a confirmed result for efficacy. Now, this is a pretty generic slide. If you are going to develop a drug for any human disease, you, you tend to go through a standard process. You tend to come up with an idea, you tend to come up with what's known as a therapeutic target. You think about how you will develop a drug to hit that target, and then you'll go through a whole bunch of processes before, as the tap at the end of this slide suggests, you end up with a drug at the end that people can take. Our next speaker tonight, Kevin, is going to explain to you how 
in developing copper ATSM as a therapeutic agent for motor neuron disease, we didn't strictly follow this textbook. The story is much more than that. It's a story of people coming together, circumstances, and seizing opportunities when they came along. So I'm going to finish there, but the last thing I'm going to say is that if copper ATSM proves to be an effective motor, uh, drug for motor neuron disease, uh, our next speaker has played a central role in making sure that this will happen. This guy was one of the people who was there at the desk when the idea to do all of this was first generated. So you're in an excellent opportunity to hear from the horse's mouth what it actually takes to get a drug into the clinic for something like motor neuron disease. Kevin. Okay, thanks Peter. I know I'm a big guy, but it's the first time I've been called a horse. I was been asked to tell you the backstory of how we come up with copper ATSM, and, and as Peter alluded to, uh, it's not your classic drug discovery uh, program. So I'm not going to take you through a classic drug discovery program. This is a story about heads up science, about being aware of an opportunity, keeping your eye on the bigger picture, not getting lost in the detail. And it's also a story, as Peter said, about people. It's about having, being surrounded by good people in a location and an environment where they can do good science, they can afford to take risks and not feel like their livelihood is threatened. That, that, that is one thing I really want to drive home. This is that drug discovery is an inherently risky business. We will not be successful unless we're able to take risks. And so that will only occur if people feel comfortable about taking risks. Uh, and yeah, that also has some implications for the way we do science today. So, in thinking about uh, the environment and the people, I need to think about where am I going to start this journey? And thinking back, it, it goes back a long way. So I'm going to take you back to 1998. 1998 was a bit of a watershed year for me. Um, my son was born, my first child. Um, my football team was created. Uh, as, as Tom said, I come from Queensland, so there's my football team. But most importantly for these purposes, I met these two gentlemen. Uh, Colin Masters, uh, one, of, one of the world's leading experts in Alzheimer's disease and neuropathologist, and Ashley Bush, who you saw in the, in the previous vi uh, video talking about his 30 years looking at the role of iron in Alzheimer's disease. Well, he also had a few detours along the way, I can tell you that. But these two gentlemen, uh, as I said, are interested in defining um, therapies for neurodegenerative diseases. And these, these have been, uh, that are prepared to not just talk the talk, an awful lot of us are prepared to talk, they were prepared to, to walk the walk. And so they were prepared to put together a, uh, a team to, to, to look for uh, drugs on uh, the range of neurodegenerative diseases. And, and there are a number of these diseases. There's the, the Alzheimer's disease, which is the one probably most of us are, are, fam are most familiar with. It's certainly the most um, highest incidence. Uh, Parkinson's disease, ALS, motor neuron, which is what we're basically here to talk about. It also includes rarer diseases such as Hummings' disease, uh, frontotemporal dementia, creutzfeldt jakob disease, which in the animal and the cow is known as, as, as mad cow disease. So it's the human form of mad cow disease. And more recently, the traumatic brain injury, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the sort of thing that affects from multiple concussions. And each of these proteins, each of these diseases are associated with uh, proteins that, that misfold and deposit, and you, you get these aggregated protein deposits within the brain. And, and most of the therapies to date uh, for these diseases are focused on trying to clear uh, the, these. So the key thing here is that, that Colin and Ashley created an environment where we're trying to do drug discovery. And if you're going to do drug discovery, you don't just focus on the, on the patient with, their, with their, their symptoms. You need to understand what's happening in the brain at, 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 a, at a functional level and also at a chemical level. Okay, so we needed to understand the chemistry. And, and these diseases, all these diseases are diseases of the synapses. So in, in Alzheimer's disease, it's, it's the, the glutamatergic synapses that degenerate. In Parkinson's disease, it's the dopaminergic synapses. And in MND, it's motor, the motor neurons. And so we need to understand the chemistry, the diverse chemistries of these, these things, because ultimately, 
for a drug to work, it work a drug is a small chemical. And it works at a, at a chemical level, it works at a biochemical level. So we need to figure out which of these pathways, and this is a very simplified version of some of the chemistry that occurs within, within a synapse. Um, people like to talk about things being complicated as being rocket science. Well, if you want to look at the chemistry of the synapse, it makes rocket science look like child's play. And <laughs> so th this, this chemistry is incredibly complex. It's built with a whole lot of redundancies and, 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 and the like. Uh, so if you pull on a system over here, you're going to have effects over, over there. And, and some of these will be beneficial and some of these will be deleterious. And our job is to try and identify which chemical reactions can we attempt to modify that will give us beneficial effects and which ones do we have to avoid because that's going to lead to inherent toxicities. And so our goal is to try and identify chemistries here that we can modulate. And obviously once we do that and identify ways to intervene, we actually, the drug development process actually then works back the other way, where we, we, we test the functionality and then obviously back into the clinic. So, where does the copper HSM story begin? It actually begins with a different disease with a different drug. That drug is PBT2 which we first invented in around 2001, which is also uh, an interesting year because it was the year my daughter was born. <laughs> um, we did, we did, we did, so this drug was developed for, for, for Alzheimer's disease, and it was developed to, take, to target those metals. So when Ashley was talking about iron, iron was one of the metals that we were, we were thinking about. This thing doesn't bind iron very well, actually. What it does bind very well is copper and zinc. So <laughs> this, this molecule, we were able to take all the way through to the clinic. Uh, we had great phase two data coming out of this. We, we, we see here a, a, a dose-dependent reduction in biomarkers, a dose-dependent increase in, in uh, memory executive function, which is one of the memory functions. And so we were all very, very, very excited about this potential drug. Um, but just to uh, indicate the, the vicarious nature of drug discovery, the actual most important number on this slide is this one here. That's the date at which the paper was published. What also happened around that time was the global financial crisis. I can tell you that when we initially uh, generated this data, we had a lot of interest from large pharmaceutical companies. We had a large deal on the table, $750 million. It was going to be the largest deal, licensing deal in Australian history. GFC hits and it goes up in smoke, disappears, just like that. So it is a vicarious type of uh, exercise. Now, while this particular compound was winding its way through the clinic, part of my job was to come up with the second generation, the next PBT2. That turned out to be a really difficult uh, proposition. We, we tried for months and years, it actually scars me to this day uh, because we couldn't do it. We, we struggled and we struggled. And what, what really became obvious is that the, the basic precepts by which we thought PBT2 worked was wrong. The way we thought PBT2 was working was wrong. We had to find out it was doing something else. And, and I was racking my brain trying to figure out what else that might be. Now, it turns out at the time I was doing that, I was sharing an office with this gentleman, Tony White, who Peter's mentioned. Tony. To say Tony is a taciturn person is an understatement. He, he, talking to Tony is literally like trying to get blood out of a stone. I shared, an, I was in the office with Tony for six months and I could not get a word out of him. Now, but I did know from talking to his students that he also was working on metal chelators and some funky things were going on. I finally got Tony to open up one day and, and it was basically because I was having a rant about how the university treats research staff like second class citizens. And that, 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 that struck a chord with Tony. <laughs> and, and so he actually joined in the rant. And, and, and on and on the rip. But once the rants were over, we could finally have the conversations that needed to be had. And he talked about the fact that these metal chelators, were act along with metals, they were activating signaling cascades, neuroprotective signaling cascades, completely, completely different. So we put PBD2 through some of these assays, and, and Peter was involved, involved in that work. And, Yes, it was looking nice, it was looking promising, 
but we couldn't prove it. We needed compounds that were able to deliver metals but actually didn't chelate. Well, while Tony and I were discussing the fact that we needed these sorts of compounds, I was introduced to this gentleman. This is Paul Donnelly from the School of Chemistry, the University of Melbourne. Um, a gentleman in the truest sense of the word. He's a very enthusiastic uh, chemist. Paul, had, at the time, had, had, just, he's, uh, had just finished a postdoc in, in Oxford and had just returned to, to Melbourne, and he was looking for opportunities to, to, to spread his wares. And he was, he, works on, he was working on imaging agents for tumours, hypoxia imaging agents. And these were the compounds that Paul was working on. So here we have copper ATSM, the hero of our story. And here we have copper GTSM, a very close analogue. Now, in this initial story, copper ATSM here is not, the, is not the star of the show. It's a supporting act. The star of the show was copper GTSM. It was the compound that was going to deliver copper and, and test our hypotheses. This one wasn't going to deliver copper. This was our control compound. It was not going to do it. Very important. When, because Paul could radio label these, we were able to show that these compounds could cross the blood brain barrier. Very important. Because obviously, when you're talking about neurological... Uh, diseases, we need to get compounds across the blood-brain barrier. It is one of the major hurdles we have in trying to cross that blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is very, very important. It keeps out a range of toxins. It keeps out, you know, uh, bacteria and viruses. I mean, there's a reason why the, uh, rubella and, and the Zika virus are deadly to the unborn fetus, but virtually innocuous to us. And that's because the unborn fetus doesn't have a blood-brain barrier, and those diseases essentially destroy neuronal tissue. Now, we've got some colleagues in Queensland who are looking at working around the blood-brain barrier, and I, I've got to be honest, I think they're playing with fire. But anyway, these compounds cross the blood-brain barrier. We, we put these into Alzheimer's mice to test our hypotheses, and this is just a, a short sample of that work, basically showing that, that the GTSM was able to rescue a memory function and, and that the ATSM didn't. So that's all very well and good. Everything went, it actually went perfectly. Some of, the, some of the best science I've been involved with is one of those few occasions where you actually hypothesize something and it works perfectly. So on the back of that successful um, uh, piece of work, I was speaking to Paul about what we could do next and, we, and he made the observation that there are some, some reports in the literature that this compound had antioxidant activities. Now, that immediately sparked my interest because redox, chemi redox chemistry is something we know. So when I talk about knowing the chemistry of, 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 in terms of designing a drug, oxidative stress, uh, which is redox chemistry, is what we know. We're all familiar with the chemistry, even though you don't think you do. It's what drives out the apples to turn brown when exposed to air. It's what causes the, the rust in, your, in the rust buckets. So it's the same chemistry. And it's, it's, a, it's a flip side of having a life that's dependent on oxygen. So that the main fact that we have to have breathe means that as a, as a side reaction to that, we're generating reactive oxygen species. We're generating free radicals that do damage. Now, in a healthy person, there are a number of defense mechanisms that will protect us against those free radicals. Now, the, the problem is that, as, and, and that, that means that everything stays in balance, balance. The problem is that as we age, of course, those defence mechanisms wear down, they're not as efficient, and essentially these ROS, these reactive oxygen species, take over. Now, why are they a problem? They, they form chemical, they chemically modify proteins, they chemically modify lipids, fats, DNA, such that those, pro, those biomolecules cannot form, perform their function. The other thing from a, from a drug discovery that's kind of nice is when I mentioned about the, the synapse, about how if we pulled on this bit over here, we might have an effect there, well, there's really no, no, no downside to inhibiting uh, the ROS. So th that was all positive. And oxidative stress is a prominent feature of neurodegenerative diseases. Okay? And here's just one uh, example of that. This is uh, looking at a, a chemical modification uh, to proteins within the, the cerebral spinal fluid of patients with ALS, and you can see that this pro these proteins are elevated, there's elevations in this chemical modification. 
Now, the, the thing about oxidative stress is it happens um, in practically every disease. It's a, it, it's a, when, cell, when cellular function goes wrong, oxidative stress occurs. Now, we end up with a, a chicken and egg type question. Okay? Does the oxidative stress drive the disease forward or is it just reporting on what's happening in the disease? And there is really only one way to test that. Basically, you take a disease model, you put something that ameliorates or stops the oxidative stress and see if that stops the disease from progressing. And so when Paul said to me that this compound may have some antioxidant uh, properties, my immediate reaction was, well, let's get this thing into an animal model as quickly as we can. We knew the compound was bioavailable. We knew it crossed the blood-brain barrier. So let's, t the, and, the, and the two models that, that stood out, uh, Parkinson's disease models and, and ALS. So I went, we went to speak to these two people. These two people are pivotal. Without these two people, this project stops dead does not get out of the thought process stage. This is David Finkelstein. He's a resident expert in, in Parkinson's disease animal models. And this is Chow Sin Lee, who at the time had a, a large colony of uh, ALS animal models. But remember, at this stage, we had no data. So on the back of having no data, I went to see David and said, how about this idea? We put the compound into, into a Parkinson's disease model. And, and, so, and, and David thought about it for the whole sum of five minutes and said yes. Chow Sin took a little longer. Now, to be fair to Chow Sin, the experiment in the Parkinson's disease takes a month. The experiment in the ALS models takes six to eight months. I cannot underestimate how much we owe these people because they did it with using their own resources to test someone else's idea. Okay? This, is, this is a completely unfunded project, but because of the environment we're in at that time, the funding environment, that they felt that they could, they, they could afford to take a risk. I can promise you, if I went upstairs today to propose that to similar researchers, no way. What are you talking about? Get out of here. Okay? We couldn't be able to go to a granting body to get it funded because we have no preliminary data. Okay? So when I said before that sometimes drug discovery requires a risk to be taken, this was our major risk. And these two people generated that initial data uh, which was then further uh, expanded on by, by Peter, and you've, you've heard that data, and, and, and you know, Peter's job in that is, 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 is uh, exemplary. Um, and, and obviously, uh, well, I had a graduate student who, who picked up the Parkinson's disease work, I'll show you that in a minute, uh, Lin Wei Hung. Uh, Lin, unfortunately, well, is no longer in science. He decided if he's going to spend a career groveling for money, he would do it for real money and he's joined a banking firm in the United States. <laughs> so, as I said, um, I cannot praise Peter's work highly enough. It is no uh, over-exaggeration to say that the, w the work that he's done with the ALS models is the most rigorous, robust data generated in that model ever. Uh, and, and even though that data was generated, best part, most of it, 10 years ago, it's still, to this day, the most robust, reproducible data. Likewise, here's Lynn's uh, Parkinson's data. And it's very similar. On, the, on, the, on this side here, we have uh, basically uh, the ability of the compound to rescue the niagaral cell, the dopaminergic neurons, which degenerate in Parkinson's disease. And you can see here, here's a healthy mouse, and here's a Parkinson's mouse, and you see that there's less neurons. And then we get a nice, if we treat with the drug, we get a nice dose dependent increase. And again, we use multiple models. Why is the significance of multiple models? No single model perfectly recapitulates the disease. All the models have their flaws. So multiple model, using multiple models, again, gives us uh, confidence that what we're looking at is real. Consistent with the fact that we see in, uh, an improvement in uh, cell number, we see improvement in motor performance in these animals. Uh, we use a pole test. And, and the animals are impaired in that poll test. So here's a, a, a normal mouse. You can see here's the degree of impairment. And again, a dose-dependent improvement. And we see improvements in the other models of the thing. So we have multiple animal models of ALS, multiple animal models of Parkinson's disease. This drug is working like a charm. It's robust. It's reproducible. Um, we've actually gone back and backfilled some of the data to show that the compound does truly uh, uh, rescue 
oxidative stress environment things. So one, one of the oxidatively uh, reactive molecules is peroxynitrite. It, it nitrates proteins. Um, and you can see here, here's a decay curve. So it's an unstable molecule, it decays. But in the presence of increasing doses of the drug, it decays faster. Okay, so this toxic uh, metabolite is de decays much, much faster. Uh, and, and, and you can see here that the, the consequence, we're looking at uh, the nitration of a protein, and we can show, again, a dose-dependent reduction in the, nit uh, the nitration of that protein. Importantly, you, we, we actually compared the compound to uric acid. Uric acid is one of your in, uh, endogenous um, scavengers of peroxynitrite. And, and you can see here that the drug performs one to two logs better, so significantly better than uric, uric acid. Why, why is that potentially important? Well, it turns out high, high levels of uric acid or urate is actually protective for, again, as, as a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. Low levels is, is, a, is an increased risk factor. So uric acid, most of you will probably re recognise it. For, it's what deposits in your joints when you get gout. Okay, so gout is actually protective against Parkinson's disease. Um, and, and with respect to motor neuron disease, well, this is a paper that was published um, last year where they were looking at a precursor of uh, uric, uric acid in the scene to, to elevate uh, urate levels, and they were looking at that in ALS. And that's still the pilot stage, but I can tell you now our drug is at least one to two logs better than that. And our, our pharmacokinetics are better, so we've, we're very confident that we, we can outperform that particular drug. So. And, and just one more little bit of data, though. I know Adam's in the audience, so I'll show this for Adam. Um, that the, the, the compound is able to rescue lipid peroxidation. Uh, so again, Adam's uh, created a, a model where he induces oxidation of lipids. And you can see here, that's the oxidizer. You can rescue that with the drug. Or well, actually, should rescue it with the molecule. Peter jumped ahead of himself when he described it as a drug. It's not a drug yet. It's not a drug yet until it goes into people. It's a molecule an active molecule. And now we had a decision to make. I said, my initial uh, driver was to check to see if these pathways were, were, were something that was, we could look to modify with drugs. But the, the data from this, these was so compelling, we had to make a decision as to, are we actually gonna move this compound forward as a potential drug? And the decision, talking to Peter and uh, to Tony and and Paul, yes, Peter was involved in those discussions. We should try and move this forward and see, see if we can actually move this to the next stage. And so if you want to do a drug, the first thing we've got to do at university is go off to the university business development office. Um, and so, and that we have to, so this man is, is Sean Lum. Sean is critical. Again, another critical point. Uh, without Sean, again, this drug would not have got anywhere near a person. We were about to enter the valley of death. Now, this is not one of your biblical valleys of death because the way out of this valley of death requires mammon. Okay? We need money to get out of this valley. And why we have a valley of death? Well, it requires these uh, activities to occur. Now, these activities are pretty much straightforward uh, intellectually. So, you know, your, your academic bodies are not, not particularly interested in doing them. Uh, they're pretty expensive, so your, by the time you've got a drug anywhere near market, your uh, IP uh, cost will tally in the hundreds of thousands. Your GMP manufacturer, so that's making it, the drug it's such that it's safe to put into people. Yeah, the best part of a million dollars. Formulation, well in this particular case it was a little tricky because of the nature of the compound. No, that's another million dollars plus. Pharmacokinetics, million plus. Toxicology, million plus. They've just spent five, six million dollars. Okay? Th that needs to come from somewhere. We need to be able to find that money from somewhere. And, and normally, the, what we're looking for there is venture capital. Venture capital is, is what fills the gap. This is where capitalism is meant to work for us, to, to, to generate benefits. Okay? But, unfortunately, w w despite Sean's best efforts, I should say, the reason why Sean was pivotal for this is because because these costs so much, the university doesn't really want to pay the cost for the patent. 
there's, there's a number of stages. They're happy for us to do the initial stage, which is a, a provisional patent. That costs five to $10,000. But that only lasts for a year. You've got a year to make up your mind. So that gives you a year to get everything together, find your commercial partner, get a business degree, agreement put in place uh, before you come to the next stage for the thing. Sean, to our, to gratefully, was able to convince the university that this opportunity was too good to throw in, and they actually, he convinced the university to pay for the next phase of the clinical develop, uh, for the intellectual property, and as such, bought us an extra two or three years to find a commercial partner. Okay, without that, because this, this took, we were well more than a year in, in the valley, and we, we were there quite a while. We, as I say, we were lost. Now, why were we lost? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, first and foremost, it's not a drug. When people, when most of the venture capitalists look at this is not a drug. You know, there's a lot of rules around what is and what isn't a drug, what can and can't be a drug. And, they, and there's a lot of words to describe that. Mostly they're um, an abomination of the English language. You know, drug likeness, drug ability, rules, more rules that you poke a stick at. And they're all <laughs> honestly. So let's, so let's have a, we're going to investigate where some of these rules and, and ideas come from. So here's a periodic table. Fun fact, it's the 150th anniversary of the, the, the periodic table this year. Yeah? 150 years. People, Germans dominated chemistry in the 19th century. They loved to classify things. Loved to classify them. And one of the things they did is they classified these elements in the concept of belonging to life, <coughs> organic, and belonging not to life, not inorganic. And so the organic essentially is up in this corner. These are the elements that they, in the 19th century, said were important for life. This one and this one here, hydrogen. That's, that's all, just them. So medicinal chemistry, drug discovery, of course, is about the discovery uh, of the chemistry of life. So medicinal chemistry is built on that organic chemistry, built on the 19th century classification of what elements are present in the body. So when we look at copper ATSM, of course, it's got that copper in the middle of it. And that's over here in the inorganic section. Okay? That's not part of life by the 19th century rules. I'd like you all to take a breath. Everyone take a big breath. Okay? Oxygen. We all live and breathe on oxygen. The capture, transport, and utilization of that oxygen is dependent on metal ions. Okay? We're all full, essentially this entire first row transition is in our body. And a fun geeky fact, arsenic. We all think of arsenic as a toxin. If you take a mouse and feed it an arsenic-free diet, it's not viable. Okay? So in some way, shape, or form, even arsenic's essential for life. We don't know why, but it is essential for life. So oh, copper is part of life, part of life. Nature uses copper. So if nature uses copper, why can't we? In effect, all these rules are doing is stifling innovation. And, well, you know, Australian VC, our, our perspective is that they're not particularly innovative. So we actually got rescued. We got rescued by a land that is mostly associated with innovation. We didn't have to chase the Americans. The Americans chased us. Particularly this gentleman here, Craig Rosenfeld. Craig comes from the US. More specifically, he's a Texan. Craig's an interesting character. Uh, he's a hematologist uh, from Dallas. He's a hematologist who, who's done a lot of development in cancer drugs. He wanted to get into neuro and thought that most of the people around the world were going about it not, not quite the right way, but he liked our data. So we took a, a side trip to see Craig and um, I met Craig at the Dallas, uh, at a hotel in Dallas Airport. Had a conversation with Craig uh, where I showed him these two videos. This is actually videos of the pole test. So basically we put the mouse on the pole. Uh, it's supposed to turn around and run down. That's what, this is a, a Parkinson's mouth. He cannot coordinate the turn and he cannot get down the pole. If you take that animal and treat it with a drug, Craig was sold. He's hooked. He is now in. He's now going to go away and create an entity 
which allows us to look at this drug. They created a thing called CMD uh, with his partner Kay Knoll, and they allowed us to cross the Valley of Death. Uh, I've picked the Golden Gate Bridge on purpose because CMD, Collaborative Medicinal Development, their headquarters are located at, uh, in Salsalita, which is just outside San Francisco. So we've crossed the Valley of Death and we're into, clinic, we're into, the, into the clinic. Here's the, the phases of the clinical trials. Peter said there's a variety of these phases. We've just done the phase one. It's normally done in healthy patients. The exception for that, there was, in, there was some exceptions to that in, in oncology because um, the outcomes are so poor that you're allowed to actually go straight into, into patients. And by analogy with that, that's why we, we've done motor neuron. If you look at the disease progression in motor neuron disease, it's, it is relatively rapid. Uh, the disease progression in Parkinson's disease is slow. There's many, many difficulties in trying to design clinical trials for Parkinson's disease. Um, although we have actually put ATSM in Parkinson's disease, we expect to have a result in the middle of the year. Um, that work, clinical trial stuff, Susan Mathers and, and, and Dominic Rowe. Just summing up where we're at. We've done the, the basic stuff, we've crossed the valley of death, we've finished our phase one. And this is why we've got to try and keep a lid on our excitement, because this is basically where we're at. There's still the phase two and phase three trials to go. There's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot that can go wrong. So while we're very, very excited and hope, but we're also realistic about what's to come, because there is a lot of work to go. I made the comment at the beginning about the neurodegenerative diseases, and I wanted to try and find a drug for all of them. That's my goal. Well, here's where we're at to date. We've had the Alzheimer's disease, uh, PBD2, you know, I've mentioned. We have a, a tr clinical trial with this particular compound starting at the back end of this year. ATSM, you know about. Prana Biotechnology survived the GFC and continues to produce molecules, and they have a compound which is going into Parkinson's related phenomena. Um, and, and you can see the rest here. And with that, I would just like to thank all the people who have done the work. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I think Peter and I are happy to take any questions you might have.